shock the system. Welcome to Dank Discussions with your host, Calican CEO, Maynard Breslow. In each episode, you'll learn from the trailblazers, leaders, entrepreneurs, and influencers in the ever-moving, ever-growing cannabis industry. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Dank Discussion. Today, we're joined by Diana Pena. Diana is the co-founder of Miriam's Hemp. I'm going to have a great discussion with her, so thanks for joining us today, Diana. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No, the pleasure is all mine. Um, you know, really excited to speak to you. You have an amazing, amazing story and amazing brand as well. Um, a lot of insight. You know, we're going to be talking about, obviously, your personal story. Uh, very, very uh, powerful story. Um, and talking about how that kind of led to manufacturing and how to manufacture hemp products and, and how, you know, kind of like the ancient days, so to speak, of CBD yeah. and all that fun stuff and the medical use of CBD products. So um, definitely um, a lot of good things to touch on, you know, as, uh, as we always say in the, um, you know, as we always say, but we started off easy, right? So uh, first, let me hear where you're based out of today. I actually am in Las Vegas. We recently moved the company out here um, back in January. So we're trying to get everything set up here. So we were out of, we did operate out of California for the last almost eight years. Um, But like I said, we just moved out here to Las Vegas. Wow. Yeah. I definitely want to get into, you know, the California side and everything, I guess, before we get into that, what was kind of the, uh, the reasoning for the move? What was, you know, um, I mean, honestly, probably number one would be taxes. Um, yeah, we're all leaving know. California for that reason. You know, <laughs> yeah, just talking to my accountant. She's like, she's like, you need to get out of, move your company out of California, please, for my sake and for your sake. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's probably number one, I would say, but probably just as equally, um, we couldn't, we had a really hard time finding a location to manufacture out of. Um, There wasn't a lot of, even though it's legal in California, um, a lot of building owners uh, were still scared and they, because they were not, some people are not really educated that CBD is not, they think that we're going to be in there manufacturing um, marijuana. You know, they would, I think they would hear about like uh, people manufacturing and buildings exploding and stuff like that. Um, And that's not what we do. We we don't, we don't do that anymore. We used to um, extract, but we don't anymore. Um, so that was the main hurdle that we came across is trying to build a warehouse, um, is that nobody would really allow it. Um, and in Vegas, the laws are a little bit, there's no CBD laws in California here. There, there's a little bit more established, um, than California as well. Plus the other thing that we, the other thing was that we actually, we've kind of caught wind because obviously we keep, we keep up with a lot of the laws and we, we always consult with lawyers. Um, and one of the things that we've been hearing um, is that it looks like in California, they might try to regulate the CBD industry the way that um, marijuana is being regulated, um, which is really crazy. Um, and basically making it very expensive and licensed and uh, very, you know, fees for here and for this and that. And um, some cities were actually already trying to implement that. Um, when we were, when we would call different cities to see if they would allow CBD, we would call directly like the city council and get a hold of like the city planners and stuff like that. Um, Cause we really wanted to make sure that wherever we went, we were going to be okay. And so there was a couple of places that we called, um, for example, I think Corona was one of them. And they were trying to, they said, well, we don't have anything in place yet, but we are trying to implement something that's going to be similar to the way that the marijuana and the the cannabis industry is set up where we're going to have, you require you to have licensing. And we're just like, oh my God, this is going to be crazy. Um, So it's just, it's the over-regulation in California and the taxes, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's horrible, right? I mean, you know, I'm uh, L.A. born and raised, you know. Yeah. And, but we're seeing the the kind of the exodus, so to speak, of California. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, the, that, you know, they want to talk about regulation. They want to talk about this and that. And, you know, we, we know that there's a lot of uh, stuff going on in the industry that does need regulation. But they use this uh, guise of regulation. But really, it's a money grab, right? 
Oh, yeah. You know, really, it's about they see, oh, my gosh, we make so much money with the cannabis. You know, we make people get, you know, pay tens of thousands of dollars for the application, maybe, or, you know, thousands of dollars, not even sure if they're going to be able to get it, not get it, you know, and and a lot of corruption going on, a lot of this and that going on. And now all of a sudden, oh, (laughs) there's a whole nother sector over here that we're just letting them make this money freely. Mm -hmm. Anybody in their mother, so to speak, can set up in the CBD company and, you know, in California and and have that going on. And, you know, um, it's, uh, it's really just a money grab and it's really sad. And it is. Yeah. And you've been there right for, you know, you're talking about eight years. Um, you know, yeah. And I mean, you know, and, and it's funny that you say that it's a money grab and there's a lot of corruption. And we saw that. We literally saw that firsthand uh-huh. um, because we during before legalization, um, we were we were involved with people that had um, that were setting up dispensaries um, and trying to pass laws. And um, and it was a money grab. It was whoever you knew. If you knew somebody in the city council, if you knew somebody not only if you knew somebody in the city council but if you had enough money you were going to get that license for that dispensary even if somebody was better qualified had already had an application in before you um and we saw that firsthand and it was very disheartening um to see that um and so which is part of the reason why we 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 took the company and got out of the marijuana industry in california and kind of separated ourselves out because um, we're, you know, we're not, we're, we're, we've always been small. We've, we were, we were a mom and pop and we couldn't even, even though we were ingrained already for a few years and we had a lot of customers, um, we weren't even able to get licensed um, because of how difficult they made it to, for, for companies like us to get licensed. um, It made it almost impossible. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. And, you know, and, talking about earlier that you've been doing this for coming up on eight years, you know, eight years. And, uh, you know, obviously in the cannabis industry, especially in the regulatory side, this is uh, like an eternity, right. You know, so yeah. I want to get into kind of that, that transition to kind of that, what you've seen over the last eight years, but first and foremost, you know, I think the, the, you know, I want, I want to talk about your story and I want to talk about Miriam's hemp and I want to hear about, you know, talk to me about your relationship with cannabis going all the way back and kind of uh, what led to Miriam's hemp and, and how this thing all played out. Yeah. Um, well, it started with my mom. Obviously, my mom was Miriam. And, um, you know, growing up, I even in my early, early 20s before way, this is way before um, this is like in the ni- late 90s. I, um, you know, I never was against marijuana. I never thought it was bad. Um, you know, I knew that it could help people with anxiety and stuff like that. And I actually used to smoke quite a bit for a little while in my early twenties. Um, and then, you know, as time went on, I just, I didn't, you know, I never, I, I stopped for like a few years and then my, my mother in 2013, um, was diagnosed, um, very, and it was a very all of a sudden type of thing that happened. Um, you know, one day from one day to another, she started having symptoms a few months before, Um, and, and then obviously as time went on, things started kind of getting worse because that's just how it is with a lot of different brain cancers. Um, you start, you start having symptoms even years before you get diagnosed with my mom. We noticed, um, changes with her. I would say about maybe like six months before she was diagnosed. Um, and then as time went on, things just started getting worse and worse. And so finally one day, my sister decided to take her to the hospital when we just couldn't, we were like, something's really wrong. Um, and it was then that, you know, just out of nowhere, they said, your looks like your mom has a brain tumor. And we're like, what in the world? I mean, then it made sense, everything that had been going on. And then of course, you know, um, she obviously gets taken in to the, to emergency. Um, they take her in right away. A few days later, they, they do a biopsy and unfortunately, she was diagnosed with a glioblastoma, um, which is one of the most deadliest forms of brain cancer, um, primarily because it's very aggressive and resistant to most treatments. Um, and with my mom, it was even worse because of the location we couldn't even operate. So because of that, um, her prognosis was really poor. 
Um, typically people with brain cancer, um, glioblastomas are given about, about an 18 month prognosis. However, if you're able to get surgery, you can live longer because they, they remove it. Um, they do treatment. And sometimes people go, you know, a couple of years without, or even a few months without recurrence. Um, and I know this because we deal with a lot of our customers that have glioblastomas. And, um, you know, I know that the people that are able to get surgery, they do survive a, a lot longer. But with my mom, we couldn't do surgery. Um, and so immediately they said, you know, your mom is going to maybe if if the treatment with treatment, she could possibly live three to six months. So we we're just like, oh, my I mean, could you imagine that just from one day to another, you're they're telling you. Your, your parents' terminal. It's just such, it was such a devastating news. Um, and it, it, my mom was also very young. My mom was only, at the time of her diagnosis, she was only 57. Oh. Um, and her and I were very close because we, so prior to me getting into the, biz, the cannabis industry, I used to be a makeup artist and a hairstylist. My mom was a makeup artist. And so her and I had a business together. So we spent a lot of time together. We would do weddings and makeup um, together. And so we were also extremely close. And so to hear this was just like, it was just very devastating. And so obviously I didn't know anything about brain cancer. And so I started researching and I, and I knew, I, I, I knew about, I knew that there was clinical trials and I feel that this around this time, cancer clinical trials were becoming like more, and I don't know if it's because I was researching it, but they were becoming more known. Um, and so I started researching, trying to see if there was any kind of brain cancer clinical trial that I could get her into. And unfortunately, um, there wasn't anything of, I remember there wasn't anything available at the time or she didn't qualify for them. And so in doing that research, I came across a study that was done actually in Israel, um, in Spain, um, by Manuel Guzman, who's a very, I don't know if you've heard, I'm sure you've heard of him. And a lot of people in the industry have, um, but they had done a study on the, the, on glioblastoma, uh, and the type of chemotherapy that my mom was doing, combining it with cannabis. Huh. And, but they had only done some studies on some rats, but it, it they, according to the study, it looked promising. And basically the study was saying that um, the cannabis was enhancing the effects of the chemo, which was helping the chemo work better. Um, so then I was like, okay, wow, this is interesting. Um, and so when I started, I said, I'm going to research can this cannabis seems to, you know, if it's, if it seems to be working with this and helping this chemo work better, there has to be something here. And so when I researched, I, I started researching cannabis and cancer. Um, there wasn't a ton of information like there is now, but a lot of stuff came up. And so then um, there was another study that I found that I believe was done in Israel on, um, on cannabis and brain tumors. And so I was like, oh my gosh, this is, wow, this is so interesting. And so then... Um, I don't remember how, but so somehow I, on Facebook, uh, I came across a cannabis and cancer group, a cannabis oil, uh, a cannabis oil success story group. And at the time there was only maybe about, a, like less than a thousand people in the group, but I met some of the most amazing, helpful people in that group. And they were like, you need to get your, you need to look at this, find this YouTube video. Um, and it was a Rick Simpson video showing you how to make the cannabis oil. They, and there wasn't a lot of information. They just said, find this video, um, teach yourself how to make the oil and give your mom that the oil. So I found the video and I said, okay. And at the time, um, well, first I tried calling dispensaries and delivery service, well, delivery services at the time, there wasn't really any well, there was illegal dispensaries, but at the time it was mainly delivery services and everywhere that I would call, nobody knew what full extract cannabis oil was. Everybody was trying to sell me butane extracted wax. 
And I was like, I don't think that's what I want to give my mom. And I didn't really know the difference. I wasn't really familiar with what wax was at the time. And so I was like, I don't think that's what I want to give my mom. And I'm pretty sure I know what butane is. I know that that's not what I want to give my mom. And I said, I, so I had a hard time finding it. And so obviously nobody had it. So I had to resort to making it myself. And, um, my sister, my sister's boyfriend at the time, well, he still smokes weed now, but at the time he smoked weed. And so I said, Hey, Corey, I said, I'm going to buy. So I, I did end up buying like a, like an ounce of, of, of flour. And I said, I'm going to buy this flour. Can, here's this video. Can you make this video or, um, follow the instructions. I'll buy you the crock pot and the alcohol. And can you make this for me? And he's really, he's a very smart kid. And so he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure I can do it. So in my mom's condo in the little backyard, I remember we were making, he was making this oil. And so I, you know, he took like almost all day cause it, it literally took like hours to do. And so he made the oil for me and I started giving it to my mom and I started sharing her story on social media. And I also had at the time, you know, obviously I was really involved in Facebook and very involved in this group because I had met a, a lot of people that were very helpful. Um, and at the time there was a little, there was a girl named Alyssa who had a, a stage, uh, an astro, it was a different type of brain cancer, but her story, she was the only other brain cancer person that I knew that was doing um, cannabis and had had a lot of success. And what her parents had done is um, they had stopped giving her chemo and just give, got, started giving her a ton of cannabis oil. And within months, the tumor had shrunk to like nothing or I think had dis it did, had disappeared. So she was kind of like very popular and well known in the in the in the social media realm and in the groups uh -huh. so i found i found her family i found the little girl i had heard about they're like you need to talk to her mom you need to find her mom and talk to her so i did and um became friends with her on social media and i said i need to know what you're doing i need i need to know exactly what you gave her so she said well we were just giving her a, we just basically gave her a ton of oil every day and i was like oh wow they're like, she was high and, but she would sleep all day. Um, and then I've, you know, and then she explained to me that after a while you, she got used to it and it took a few months. Um, but so I basically followed what she did with her daughter. And, um, and during this course at the time in the beginning, when I first started giving my mom the oil, we started her on radiation at the same time. And, um, so I started giving her obviously a little bit, um, and I would say about seven months into, into my mom's cancer journey and me giving her the oils, um, this would be around. So my mom was diagnosed in January and we started her on treatment, you know, because of insurance and everything. It doesn't sometimes when um, insurance doesn't approve things right away. So it takes weeks. So we, my mom started treatment, I would say the end of February and through October, and so in October, um, they did an MRI and the tumor hadn't necessarily shrunk, but it had stopped growing. Wow. And so um, in October, they said, OK, well, we want to give your mom a break from chemo. So she's not going to be on anything for a few months. And I, I, that freaked me out. I was like, OK, that's not good. Um, I can't just not give my mom you know, I, that really scared me. And so that's when I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do what they did with her name was Aly Alyssa. Um, I'm just going to do what they did with Alyssa and just give my mom a ton of oil. And so that's what I did. Um, I started giving my mom, I slowly worked her up to like probably about two to two and a half grams a day. So this is, we are talking about like almost a thousand milligrams of THC a day. And so um, we did this from October to April. I was giving her a ton of oil. Um, and then in, by March, they said, okay, we, we should probably go in and do another MRI. And I kind of knew, I kind of felt like it was working because my mom looked, my mom was, I mean, 
she never regained back her ability. So in the beginning, when my mom was first diagnosed after her, after they did a biopsy, my mom stopped talking. Um, and she also started getting like side weakness and started losing mobility. Um, the talking never came back, but the mobility came back. She was a little bit better with um, the use of her arm. Um, so she looked fine. She looked good. And so I knew, okay, well, she can't be getting worse because she looks fine. Um, and so when April came around, um, they did another MRI and I wish I had a side-by-side -side of her MRI. Her tumor went from like, it measured like a 3.6, 3.4 uh, centimeter tumor. It went down all the way to like less than a one centimeter tumor. It was tiny. It was incredible. Um, her doctors were like, well, so they tried to say that sometimes chemo can keep working for months after, which I didn't really believe. Um, but the fact that she wasn't on anything from October to April, only cannabis. And in April, her MRI showed her tumor had shrunk that much. I said, there's definitely something here. And so it was, it was, de and, and, and at that point, I, this had been almost a year that I was already involved in the groups. Uh -huh. And I had, you know, obviously I had a little bit of knowledge on how to make the oil. So I had been helping people along the way, how to teaching them how to make the oil, um, guiding them on what I was doing for my mom, what I was giving her, how I was giving it to her. And so um, when I shared my mom's results, I mean, it took off on Facebook. Um, people were sharing it like crazy. I can't even tell you how many shares that post got. Um, it was pretty amazing. Um, and so at that point, um, we were, we weren't, we weren't making the oils obviously for anybody else, but I started getting inundated with people asking for more help and wanting more information and just really flooding my, my instant messenger on, on Facebook. And so at the time, um, my, my partner who I was, well, my boyfriend at the time, um, Jeff, uh, he used to, he was in real estate. I was a makeup artist, hairstylist. And, um, it was funny because we were driving home one day from visiting his uncle in, um, in Oregon. And he was like, why are you always on your phone? And da, da, da. I'm like, I'm like, you know what? I go, I think there's something here. He thought I was just like bullshitting with friends on online. Uh -huh. And I'm like, no, I'm, I, and I showed him my phone. I go, look at all these people want the oil that my mom, that we're giving my mom, but yeah. they're having the same issue that I am. They can't get it. I go, I think that we you don't should know how to make it. You've like come in now and started a process and then done things. Right. Right. And so he's, Jeff is very, I mean, Jeff, even till this day has probably like smoked weed maybe one time. Um, he was, and still is a very straight edge person. He doesn't drink. He doesn't really drink. Um, and so that the idea of him um, selling weed was like, oh, hell no, that's illegal. Oh, I don't want to get in trouble because obviously back then it was still not, you know, we only had um, 215, you know, you, you, it wasn't technically legal it, yeah. unless you were a medical patient. So I said, okay, I go, but I just think that there's something here and we could help a lot of people. So then um, we kind of talked about it, but I, he wasn't really too like, like set on the idea. So the, as the days went on, I kept kind of bringing it up and I was like, look, I go, what if I talk to a lawyer, I'll set up something we could go, I'll find a, I'll, I'll find a marijuana lawyer. We can go talk to him. He was still kind of on the fence, but he was like, okay, fine, we'll go. And um, so we went, we went, we talked to a lawyer and he gave us the pros and cons of like, um, yes, you can get in trouble, but if you become a medical marijuana collective, you'll be protected. So he felt a little bit better, but he was still very on the fence. And so it kind of took him, I remember it took him like a few days to process it. And we talked about it again. And he finally was like, okay, fine. I'll help you get it started, but you're going to do this on your own. I don't, I'm just going to help you pay for it. I was like, okay, cool. I'm totally fine. That's fine. We, you know, you, we could do that. So 
we decided to go ahead and do it. We paid the lawyer. He set up all the paperwork for us. He did everything. And um, I remember at the time, I think my sister's boyfriend was still helping me with it. And then um, I had, you know, I had told my, um, my Jeff at the time, well, you know, here's, you know, here's how you make it. And so he started helping me a little bit more. And, um, but he was still really busy at the time. He was really busy with real estate. So he wasn't really able to kind of get fully involved in the whole process of it. Um, but I think it was after the first month, once he saw how busy and how many orders we got, he was like, okay, there's definitely something here. Um, and it just kind of took off from there. Um, we were so busy from the, from the get-go. And this was even before the whole CNN thing came out before this was like a few months before the Sanjay Gupta thing came out, because when that hit, that's when we really took off. Um, because, and so what happened, so what happened from that point, once he started helping me, obviously we we were able to start making the oil for more people and we were literally doing it out of our apartment. Um, he started researching how to filter the smell. I mean, if you saw the way we operated in the beginning, it was really crazy. Um, and so what happened after that is, so once we started getting more people coming to us, um, a lot of the people that were coming to me didn't have their medical marijuana like, uh, recommendation. So I had found a doctor, um, her name was Dr. Bonnie Goldstein, who's a very pretty well-known pediatrician in the cannabis industry. Um, I, had, I had heard about her, and so I was referring everybody to her. Uh, she was also pretty local to where we live, and so I was sending people to her to get their medical marijuana recommendations. And so um, one day she, I get, I get a phone call and she said, Hey, you know, um, I've been getting a few people um, from you. And I guess she asked one of, after seeing how many people we were referring to her, um, she decided to ask, you know, where um, can I get more information on the, the, the products that you're getting? So she contacted us and she said, you know, um, I just want to get more information on what products you guys carry. Can you send me your lab results? So we did. And then that's how the, our first relationship with a medical doctor started um, was, you know, I was initially sending her patients and then she started um, sending her patients to us. Mm. And so that's kind of how we got involved. We started getting involved with doctors and nurses because then from there um, we started working with a uh, nurse Eloise who we still work with to this day. And again, kind of the same thing. It just kind of evolved from there, the relationship with um, doctors and nurses, because as time went on, obviously it took a while, I feel like for a lot of doctors and nurses to get involved um, because it was really difficult um, to find um, uh, doctors to send people to, to get recommendations. A lot of people, a lot of doctors were fully booked. Um, and, but as time went on and, and as, as Bonnie would train other doctors and Eloise would train nurses, we, and so the network grew and grew and grew more. Um, and that's pretty much how it, it, it really evolved from there. The, the, the connection that we made in the industry with, um, other doctors and nurses. Um, and we became very, I think we became very more medically geared because of the customers that we would get at the time we would call, we could call them patients. We can't call them now that now, but um, at the time, the patients that we would get were all people that were um, severely ill. Um, a, a lot of brain cancer patients, obviously, because I was really involved in that community. Um, but then once we were able to start getting CBD, because that was a whole nother ordeal um, was finding CBD in 2013, 2014 was literally like finding gold. You could not find CBD uh, anywhere. Of course. Anywhere. Like a lifetime ago in this industry, you know, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I tell you some of the things that we went through just to get CBD. Um, we didn't even know this until the documentary came out, but Jeff and I used to drive I don't know if you've heard of that documentary called Murder Mountain. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So 
we had no idea how dangerous it was to drive up there, especially alone. Yeah. We used to make the drive up to Murder Mountain to get, find CBD. Um, there was a grower out there, one of the only growers that we could find um, that had CBD flower. Um, and so we used to travel up to Murder Mountain. And we were like, oh, this is really nice. This is so out there. There's This is so off the grid and there's nobody out here. And, you know, and it was funny because it wasn't until like, I think the documentary came out like a couple of years ago. And I was like, oh, what's this about? And I'm like, wait, this is Garberville. This is like where we, this is where we used to go (laughs) to get CBD by ourselves um, with no cell phone reception, um, just driving around um, because there's no- just knock on doors? How do you even get to that? uh... Well, it was really crazy because you literally, there's no street names, nothing. You literally follow directions like this. Okay, you're going to get to- when you turn, when you get to the light, you're going to go right. And then you're going to go up the mountain and you're going to go past a post office. And then past that post office, you're going to go past, um, three, 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 uh, three trees. And then you're going to see a rock with a bunch of graffiti. You're going to turn right into that road. Um, and then you're going to, you're going to turn left and you're going to see an abandoned car with a bunch of graffiti. You're going to try literally, those are like the directions that you'd have to follow. There was no, it was all, um, what do you call just, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, how do you say it? Um, like checkpoints, not checkpoints. Like, um, um, I know what you're saying. The, I guess just like spots, like find Mm -hmm. this you're gonna see this tree with all this graffiti landmarks 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 there you go yes oh my god yes landmarks it was that's how yeah and that's how we would find the that's how we found the the grower that we that we knew because well obviously once you got to his house there would be like a number or an address but to get there it was just you would have to literally drive there through by landmarks. Um, but it was, it was, I guess it was good that we didn't know how dangerous this location was because we probably wouldn't have gone up there. But now that we, we, you know, in hindsight, we're like, wow, we've really have like done some crazy stuff to get, you know, to get, you know, the product for people. Um, so yeah, a lot of people don't know that crazy story because we didn't even know how dangerous this it's probably better. Was. It's probably better, right? So yeah, yeah, exactly. I have a question though. So how'd you go from um, you know having cannabis THC and that's where it was to now transitioning and even looking for CBD and saying, okay, this is where it was. Was that also from from the Facebook groups or or how was that transition like? Why? How did that come about? Well, well, the CBD. So it's funny because the the, the our basic our our CBD line that we have right now, like our daily fifty. I'm sorry, our daily 50, our daily 100 and our daily 25, we've always carried those. So we've always had hemp CBD. Um, From 2011? But so, I'm sorry? From 2011? From, well, we, when we were able to get it was probably around like 20, uh, 2014, we were able to find the growers, high CBD growers that we connected with. And we were able to get high CBD flour to make high CBD um, products. Um, but the reason that we were that we started carrying high CBD was actually because Dr. Goldstein. So when the CNN thing came out, Charlotte's Web got inundated with uh-huh. thousands of people wanting to get their kids on this oil. Uh-huh. And they got so many requests that they, they had to create a waiting list. And so Bonnie also, Dr. Goldstein, sorry, also had a waiting list of kids that were literally were like, OK, they couldn't find CBD anywhere. And so she approached us and said, is there any way that you guys can make this CBD product? And that's why we had, we went looking for it because she said, if you guys can get, can make CBD, I have literally probably hundreds of kids that I can send your way for this product that they can't, you know, they Charlotte's web had a waiting list of like, I don't remember. It might've been like over a year or something like that before they were estimating that they were going to be able to get these kids on, on the oil. Um, so that's why we, that's when we introduced CBD. I was giving my mom already some CBD, okay. um, but yeah, the high CBD tinctures were because Dr. Goldstein was really desperate to get her patients um, or find it for her patients. Um, as far as a transition from like a 
a marijuana company to just a hemp company um, is really going back to what I was talking about, how um, when we tried to get licensed, it was impossible. Um, it was really difficult because of the cost and um, just the, the bureaucracy, bureaucracy of getting licensed. Um, you know, we went from being um, completely 100% integrated to having to go through um, a bunch of other people to manufacture our product, to sell it, to distribute it. Um, the whole, you had to have somebody in that chain of custody take over was really expensive. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, for example, we used to carry a tincture that was really, one of our tinctures that was really popular was our, our THC tincture. A 10 milligram tincture that we would carry was like 30 bucks. Um, if we would have became licensed and by the time that product made it to the shelves on the dispensary, we were gonna have to charge probably about $120 for that product. So all these people that we had that were buying it from us for years at $30, we're now going to have to go to a store and pay probably about 120. And that's not even, and that's us barely making any margin on it. That's just us getting it on the shelves and paying wow. everybody else mm -hmm. and barely making any profit. Um, which wasn't going to sustain us because if we're not really making any profit, we're not going to survive. Um, and so we had to make the decision, you know, once regulation came in and then, you know, Jeff, Jeff was like, you know what? I think we just, we need to stop trying to be, because we tried, we tried since like 2000, early 2015 to try to get licensed um, before legalization came in and the laws changed. And it was very frustrating um, uh, very, very, uh, stressful. And so once that happened, we just, he, he, he actually said, you know what? I, I really didn't want to give up. I was like, no, 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 let's try, let's try, let's try this. Let's talk to this person. Let's do this. Let's do that. And, you know, he was like, let's just do this. Let's take the products that we have now because they're technically, they qualify as hemp and let's just convert everything to a hemp company. And, and I'd never even thought about this, but we, we, then I'm like, okay, well that's yeah. Because then now we can ship out of state. And so we did that and it was, it was a scary transition, you know, mm -hmm. um, to switch over. Uh, but luckily we survived it. Um, and luckily we were able to retain, I would say most of the customers that we had, because I would say most of the people that we had we're using both. They were using CBD and THC. Uh -huh. um, so that's, that's really why it was just, we really, we tried very much. So to stay in, in California, in the cannabis um, and it just, it would, it would have not worked out for either for us. Um, and, and the patients wouldn't have been, there's no way that people were, were going to be able to afford the products. They were, it was, they were just way too expensive. Um, no, definitely, definitely and sourcing, everything like that. Now, talk to me as well. You know, I think when we left off with, with the story with your mom, you know, I think, you know, transition to, into the business. And, you know, I think you're saying that, uh, that the, uh, the doctors who are saying that the, uh, the chemo keeps going, but that the, the tumor had shrunk, right? So talk to me. What yeah. Happened Three, two, one, two, ignition, lift off. We at Calican are passionate about cannabis and CBD marketing, branding, SEO content, and web design. If you are a cannabis owner and you know you need an uptick in business or an upgrade in the way your customers perceive you, come check us out at Calican.com and schedule a time to speak with us today. So, unfortunately, um, at the time when, well, everything was great. We were ecstatic and we're just like, oh my God. I mean, out of, at that point, it had been over a little bit over a year since her diagnosis. And, you know, it had been a very um, sad time for us and a very difficult year with my mom, you know, to see her go from a healthy person to see her going to not being able to um, talk 
um, to not being able to sometimes walk or lose, lose mobility in her hands. And um, so this was probably one of the most, the happiest times during the time that my mom was going through her cancer battle, we were ecstatic. And so what happened, because the tumor had shrunk so much, the doctor decided to take her off steroids. Oh, and yeah. this is kind of where everything went downhill for us. Um, because um, my mom had been on steroids at that point for a little bit over a year. And, um, and taking her off steroids uh, was pretty detrimental on her body. Um, and I also think in hindsight now, I think that we, the doctor probably took her off too quickly um, because she literally went and, and the re so the reason it was easy for us to give my mom such high amounts of oil was also because, um, she was taking a lot of steroids. So it, she was hungry all the time. Um, and so because she was hungry all the time, she was able to eat a lot. And so her being able to eat a lot was made her, um, gave her the ability to, to, to resist being on such high amounts of oil. And so unfortunately, when they took her off steroids, um, I would probably compare the come down for her off of the steroids, almost like coming off of like drugs, like meth. It made her really, really sick. Um, she stopped eating. Um, she literally lost about 30 pounds in like one month. Um, it was really, really difficult. Um, and so unfortunately we had to stop, we had to really taper down the amount of oil because I would give her the oil and she would just throw up. Um, it was really difficult. And so it took about maybe about a month and a half for her to kind of get back to like not feeling sick, but then she was just very skinny, very weak. Um, and, uh, we were never able to give her the amount of oil again, um, that, she was on before that. Um, and it wasn't just, it was a struggle. It was really difficult. And so at this point, um, she's, she just was very weak, um, very skinny. And even though I tried, we tried really hard and I tried to give her the oil. We were never able to get her back up to the doses that were keeping the tumor away. And so a couple months went by, she was okay. And then she just really started to decline. Um, and I would say by the summer, the beginning of the summer, we had to put her on a wheelchair. Um, and then towards the, the middle, towards the end of the summer, she just really was very, very weak, declining a lot. And we, so we started noticing signs of the tumor coming back. And so then, um, by September, they did another MRI and it was really bad. <clears throat> um, the, sorry, I just, I just always remember, um, I just always remember that day when, um, when we went to go get her results and, um, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, sorry. It just, I just remember that day, um, when we went in and she was already really weak and she couldn't even really even sit up that well. And just getting the news that, I mean, the tumor had just came back with a vengeance and um, it was really far gone. It had been, it was wrapped around her brain stem. It was just everywhere. And so um, this was in like early September, I believe. And so then um, at that point, we just, I knew like there was really not much more we could do. Um, they, you know, they, they were saying radiation wasn't going to be, because when it comes to brain radiation, um, we only did one round. We didn't want to do more. Um, and so we didn't, you know, they said brain radiation would probably not really do much. If anything, it, it, it could even kill her faster. Um, so we just basically opted to just not do anything. Um, they didn't give us any options. There was really nothing left for us to do. So she actually ended up passing away about a month later after we, we, um, yeah. Um, so that was really difficult. Um, but even though my mom ended up passing away, um, I knew that the oil helped her and I knew, and I, because I knew I never lost faith in that because I knew, I mean, the whole time we had her on these really high amounts, 
you know, we saw what we saw the, the MRI results, you know, and um, I would say that was probably the best as far as quality of life that my mom lived um, throughout her diagnosis was when she wasn't doing any chemo and she was only doing the oil. Uh-huh. Um, and so then um, it never deterred me. I mean, I was literally even still, I remember being in the hospital um, because once we took my mom off life support, my mom actually lived almost a whole week after being taken off life support. Wow. And, you know, we, I sat there with her and I was still working. I was still talking to people. I was still, I never gave up. Um, because I never lost hope and, and, and I never wanted to stop helping other people. Um, and I, and I'm glad it, it never, I was glad that like, even though my mom passed away, I never lost, um, um, hope in what we were doing because I saw what it, it did for her. Um, and you know, and, I, and I'm, and I also was very realistic, you know, I know that it's not a miracle. It's not a miracle plant, even though people say, Oh, it's, it can cure. no. Um, but it can definitely do a lot. It can definitely help. And yes, um, we have seen it. And there are medical studies that show that it, it can um, has, it does have anti-tumor and anti-cancer effects, but you know, it, it doesn't, it isn't going to save everyone's life, um, but it can definitely do a lot. And we've seen it with my mom. Um, we've seen it with the thousands of people that we've helped now up to this point, you know, my mom passed away in 2014. Um, but you know, we still have, have seen so many incredible stories with, um, not just with cancers, but, um, also we, we work a lot with, um, kids with autism and, um, we see a lot of just amazing, um, uh, amazing differences and turnarounds that some of these kids have. Um, so yeah, so, I mean, um, you know, like I said, it, it started with my mom, but it, you know, even though she did not survive, um, you know, we've, we, we, her, her legacy continues to live every day through the work that we do with the company. Amazing. No, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm so sorry uh, you've gone through that. Um, and my heart goes out to you, your family. Thank you. Um, you know, I know that's not easy to recreate that, you know, to, to relive that. So, um, sorry for taking me down that road, you know? No, um, it's okay. It's okay. I, I don't, I don't, you know, obviously it, it's, I'll never forget it. And it just, um, for some reason, every time I think about that day, it just, it, it's, I mean, I saw my mom go through a lot, but when I think about that day, it was just, that really gets to me, but, um, I'm, I'm okay talking about it. For sure. Well, thank you, Dana. You know, and it's, um, you know, it really is, like you said, uh, the, the, the legacy, right? The memory and, um, you know, what people do, it, you know, obviously we were uh, in these bodies for a little bit, but we can leave a legacy. We can leave things that, that other people can, can gain from, gain strength from. And I know you guys have uh, helped a lot, a lot of families, you know, and uh, being able to, to do that as well. And like you said, you know, not just I'm on this side, you know, but autism, everything like that as well. Um, and you mentioned as well that, um, you know, aside from, you know, seeing the, um, you know, the tumor and how it affected the tumor, right. But more importantly, right. It gave her a better quality of life. Right. You know, and I, think, I think that's yeah. what, with a lot of people, right. Like you said, it's not a miracle drug. It's not miracles, you know, and we've seen amazing things happen for sure, you know, and, um, but you know, it's not a be all end all. It's not a magic bullet. It's not any of these kind of things, but it definitely, um, a lot of, a lot of these stories involve just improving quality of life and be able to, to, to live a better life. Um, you know, yes. Uh, yeah. For sure. So, um, I mean, talk to me as well about, you know, so you have this Facebook group, you're connected and now you, you, you know, you're also connected to nurses and you're helping families. Is that, and you mentioned you're still connected to these nurses, right? Is that still one of the main sources? Is that still, are people finding you still, you know, based on that story or, or how, how are people finding you today and, and, and what kind of impact are you having today? And, you know, yeah. Because I think, you know, CBD, I think people sometimes are just like, I'm going to find a CBD, brand. I'm going to find this brand, that brand. And there's not really yeah. sometimes many much differentiating, right? But this is like something that you, you have here, you know. Uh, Definitely. Uh, some, some anchor that people are, are coming towards over and over again, right? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I definitely want to say that uh, um, most of our our customers do come from referrals from doctors. Um, there's a few doctors that we work with now throughout the nation, not just in California, not just Dr. Bonnie Goldstein. It started with her and Eloise. 
Um, and Eloise um, has definitely opened the doors for a connection. She's um, Eloise is actually the, the president of the Cannabis Nurses Association. Uh-huh. Um, and we actually just partnered up with them recently where um, we're offering free consultations through LEAF 411. Um, so that's a whole nother network of nurses that we have as well. Um, where we're offering free consultation. Yeah. So it's definitely grown quite a bit. Um, There's a doctor out of Florida that we work with. We're actually doing a live um, with him this coming week. Um, He's a really well-known doctor that specializes um, in autism. Um, And then there's another doctor in New York who does more like general, like cancer, uh, you know, just different things. Dr. June Chin, um, we also get quite a few patients from her. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's quite a different there's quite a network of different doctors and nurses that that um, we see that come in from different places. <clears throat> and um, I think the biggest thing, I think one of the biggest things that differentiates <clears throat> Miriam's from a lot of these other brands is, um, for one, we like to focus not just on CBD, but um, you know, we focus on other cannabinoids. Um, for example, we were probably one of the first companies to come out with CBG, like almost three years ago, I think now, um, you know, now, you know, we've, we have CBDA, we have CBN, other companies do have it, but you don't really find other companies that have just straight CBG or just straight CBN. A lot of them mix it with CBD. Um, so that's kind of one thing that a lot of people like that when they come to us, um, that we offer other cannabinoids. Um, we also offer a lot of education um, because I think that's really key. And I think that's really one thing that um, really is important because like you mentioned, um, people go and they try all these brands, but people are not educated that even though it's CBD, it's, it's not all the same thing. Um, I have to, and I still do. This is one thing um, that I'm, I'm kind of struggling with right now. And I've, I've a little frustrated with, so I, I add them in, I actually add them in a glioblastoma group. Um, and it's got about like 13,000 members in it. And, um, I'm truly trying to educate people on the difference between isolates and full spectrum and, um, you know, the difference and why one's, why one is better than the other when it comes to like serious medical conditions and uh-huh. how terpenes work and how the different effects work and how, mixing certain terpenes together, um, have different effects on the oils that you use. And there's just so much information. Um, and so we really try to strive on that. Um, we really try to, and that's one thing that, um, you know, with this move out to Las Vegas and opening up the warehouse, um, that's going to, that's really one of our main focuses. Once we get settled in is to just really kind of hit the road and hit hit it harder with the education um, because there's still there's still a lot of misinformation out there um, that people that I feel that people need to be educated on not just the difference in the products but also um, taking CBD you know um, we find that one of the biggest reasons that people stop taking CBD is because they think oh one drop is a miracle drop we hear I hear this so much Um, well, I thought just taking one drop was going to do it. It's like, no, no, no. Um, you need to take it more. You need to take it more consistently. Um, you need to find the right dose. Um, so there's just a lot of information out there that I feel, um, we're, I feel that uh, for us, it's our job as a company to really educate people on, on that. Um, so we do a lot of blog posts. We, we, we try to do, a lot of um, work with other profession, medical professionals to educate um, our customers and the public. No, definitely, definitely. And I think, you know, like you were saying, right, you know, when it comes to isolate, full spectrum, <clears throat> terpenes, cannabinoids, we're finding more and more that, like you said, you know, it's not like a one size fits all. It's not just like, oh, this is great. You know, it, it really boils down to our genetics, to our DNA. It boils down to not just that, but like you said, what what is it that you're looking for, right? What is it, you know, for one, if you're you're needing help with your sleep, you're needing help with your anxiety, it's going to be a lot different than if you're needing help with, with autism or with seizures. Exactly. Or with with right. all these kind of things, it's it's a complete different animal, and and like you said, the uh, the education where people 
um, are kind of uh, because pe- it's been blown up to such a point where that's where people are kind of uh, first finding out about it. Like, oh my gosh, well, I, I should give this a shot. And then they give it a shot and it doesn't work. And they get, you know, kind of, um, you know, jaded with it or, you know, they, they, they turn away from it too quickly instead of trying it out, yes. having that patience, trying another brand, trying a different dosage, trying different right. things going on, you know, trying, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's not a one size fits all with, with that with anything. Definitely. Like it could be, yeah. you know, for a medication and that kind of stuff, you know, so. Um, yeah. Yeah, we we have like a system where we um, we have one of our, our salespeople that, that works for us. Um, we have her go through and call people that haven't ordered from us in a really long time to find out why. And I would say that 90% of the time it's because they weren't taking the right dose. Um, so, you know, th- I think that's really important aside from like, obviously finding out like what's the right oil for you. It's also finding like, what's the right, um, what's the right dose. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it happens, but it's very rare that somebody that it, if somebody has, especially somebody that has a serious medical condition, um, more than likely one little drop isn't going to do it. And, but because that's what the instructions say to start with, they think that that's what's going to work. And so, um, you know, that's kind of our, that's really our focus is, is education. Um, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, you know, centered around what you, the, you know, how the, um, company got started and, you know, what we're talking about here on the podcast, I'm sure there's going to be people that are reaching out later on that I'm sure have heard about, you You know, people who maybe reached out to you before, maybe people who are barely finding out about what's going on and looking for solutions, just like where you were, you know, in 2013, you know, so obviously things have changed a lot in the last eight years, yeah. right? Here yeah. we are 2021, right? So maybe you've already said it, but what would you tell somebody who, here's this podcast and who is looking for solutions, looking for something, you know, that they're going through with their family, um, you know, maybe not too uh, dissimilar from you, right? What would you tell them where to start, how to go about things and uh, you know, what kind of expectations they have or, or, or anything like that as well? I mean, definitely well, the number one thing we always recommend is um, if it's a really serious medical condition, um, definitely consult with a nurse um, or a doctor, a cannabis nurse or doctor that's educated in dosing. Um, and it's a lot easier to find one now than it was, you know, eight years ago, eight years ago, there was literally a few of them, a handful. Um, now there's, there, there's a lot of education with, with amongst medical professionals. Um, and the reason I say that is because, um, even though yes, cannabis is safe, um, relatively, um, for the most part, However, when it comes to mixing with certain medications and certain treatments, it's really important that people understand that there can be interactions that could be detrimental. And the reason I say that is because, for example, um, I know from my understanding, like I know that um, any somebody, some people that are doing um, like clinical trials, um, that if they're taking THC or even CBD, it can affect the clinical trial. Um, and, you know, for example, there's certain cancers that um, are uh, hormone driven um, and THC can affect a hormone. So you just have to be really careful and you have to you have to really educate yourself and make sure that whatever you're taking um, isn't going to um, affect um, your your treatment outcome. Um, CBD can, you know, CBD can can affect the blood levels of certain medications Um, So that's why you have to be really careful. That's why especially um, anti-seizure medications, um, uh, blood pressure medications. So there's just different things that you have to be cautious with um, just because it's people say, oh, it's a plant, it's safe. Yes, but it's like any other supplement, any other, you know, and even some fruits you're not supposed to take with medications. So it's this, and marijuana is no different. Cannabis is no different. Um, but in this case, uh, you definitely, definitely consult if you can. Um, and which is why we offer the free consultations with the nurses, um, because obviously we know that um, a lot of these doctors and nurses, their consultations are not going to be free. Um, but we at least want to give people the option that if they can't afford a consultation with a nurse or a doctor, they can at least get some information and some 
guidance to get started. Um, so that's really probably the most important thing. And then also, you know, seek, seek information about, you know, seek information with there's, there's dietitians that, that specialize in cancer, you know, so, cause we get, I used to get that question a lot, not as much anymore, but people used to come to me and ask me about what diet should I do? And I'm like, I'm not a dietitian. Um, so definitely come to people like us for questions about cannabis. But if you're looking for sup for questions about diets, supplements, um, definitely find somebody that's an expert in that area. Um, because I, I find I, I still get, we still get asked that quite a bit. Um, oh, you know, uh, what should I eat? You know, what kind of diet should I do if I have brain cancer? And I'm like, oh, you know, and I, ha I do have a couple of places that I refer people to. Um, when it comes to people that are looking for other alternatives, but definitely consult with professionals. You know, amazing. I mean, like, like you said, you know, um, you know, having people who are experienced in this and can lead you down the right path, you know, and I think a lot of times, obviously we're looking for Western kind of medicine approach and there's a holistic approach and then you need a lot of different kind of, uh, of uh, guidance with that and in, in different ways. And, you know, yeah. and I gotta be honest, you know, it's, um, I really got to commend you because, you know, I think there's so many, you know, touch on it briefly, but there's so many different CBD companies. There's so many different uh, brands out there. There's so many different things. And not to say that everybody's not dealing with heavy stuff and not to say that everybody's not, you know, doing the right thing with integrity or anything like that. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you probably get hit with really, really heavy stuff, you know, uh, from, from mm -hmm. different patients, you know, from, you know, as you say, you can't call them patients, but from different customers, you know, uh, who are being referred to you based on your experience, you know, and being able yeah. to give that over, you know, as, as opposed to people who are dealing with, with other things. So i um, really, um, really grateful to have you on and thank um, you and story. You know, I guess, um, you know, what now, you know, eight years in the business, you know, you've seen a lot going on, um, you know, and um, you've seen the regulation. We talked about the changes in regulation. We've talked about, you know, how, how things are even changing in California and everything like that. Right. But what's the biggest obstacle that that you're still facing with Miriam's hemp and how are you how have you been able to um, that? I think, honestly, the biggest obstacle is just like the ever changing laws still. You know, like there's still things that are very like gray area. I mean, even though here in Nevada, there, there's a little bit more of a clear view on like what the laws are, it's still kind of gray area. Um, so that's kind of scary because it's like, you don't, what's going to happen next? Um, luckily, luckily, Jeff, Jeff and I have always consulted and been very cautious about any moves that we make. Um, you know, for example, um, we were about to roll out a vape line and luckily we did it because do you remember what happened last year with the vapes? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, we, and what's funny because we did it even before the, any of that stuff happened, but we kind of had, we kind of knew just because also the nurses that we work with, they were telling us like, Hey, you know, we're not hearing really good things about vaping, blah, blah, blah. You maybe kind of hold off on that. Um, you know, so we've always been really cautious about like, things that we roll out with and making sure that like, we're not going to roll out a product that's going to end up getting banned. Um, another reason why, you know, for the longest time, the last couple of years, Delta eight was one that everyone was like, Oh my God, when are you going to carry it? Do you have it? Do you have it? And now a bunch of States are banning it. A bunch of States have come out with laws that are banning Delta eight. And a lot of these hemp companies are selling Delta eight. And so we've always been very cautious. Um, luckily, we've always made pretty good um, uh, decisions when it comes to business. But I would definitely say the biggest obstacle has been just the laws, the regulations. Um, you know, when we were in California, it, <laughs> it was actually really scary. Some of the things that we went through, always thinking like we were literally always looking behind our back, thinking that we we're going to get raided. Um, I remember hearing sirens or you would hear a helicopter fly over and we're like, this is it. We're getting raided. Oh my God. Um, you know, there was one time something was going on in our neighborhood and we used to live kind of like up on a hill. Um, and we could see from our bathroom balcony, from our, from our bedroom balcony and our bathroom window, the road down at the bottom. And we see a line of cops driving up 
and we literally thought they were coming to our house. Um, so, you know, I mean, we've, we've been through a lot, um, but we've been able to overcome a lot of obstacles. Um, you know, now that we're in this side of the industry, it obviously we feel safe. We feel much safer. Um, but I would say being in the cannabis space during those times before legalization was really scary. Um, I was scared constantly all the time. Um, and there was a lot of sweat and tears at the time, but, you know, we've been able to overcome that. Um, obviously things have changed quite a bit. Uh, but I think off the top of my head, the biggest obstacle is just really getting this warehouse going, finding a location, finding, uh, you know, the, 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 the owner that owns the building is really awesome. He's super cool guy. Um, just getting it going and making sure that like everything that we're doing is okay. And, um, you know, so, um, I would say from this point on is just kind of waiting and see what happens with the law, you know, the official federal law, what they're going to do, you know, we don't, you know, um, the FDA, that's kind of where we're waiting on right now. I know that they're looking at it and they're, they're, they're going to be supposedly rolling out, you know, more regulations, but we're actually preparing for that. So that's what we're doing right now uh, ahead of time with this warehouse is we're making, we're making the facility a GMP. Um, so G we're following, we're building it following GMP regulations. So that way, once the FDA rolls out all of their, what their guidelines are going to be, um, we're going to already be able to meet all of those standards. Um, so that's what we're doing right now to prepare. We're already, cause we know it's coming. We know at, any moment, probably within the next year or so, the FDA is going to definitely roll out guidelines and regulations for manufacturing CBD. Um, so luckily, we're, we've been able to start preparing for that. No, yeah, definitely. I think that's uh, awesome that we all face in the industry, kind of uh, that, you know, uh, hoping for the best, but kind of waiting to see what's going to happen with everything. And like you said, you mentioned there, obviously regulation, and you've been through a lot of different law changes, a lot of different regulation, a lot of different oh, yeah. having to change yeah, our definitely. model from it. And I think, you know, there's a lot of good intending people in the industry. There's a lot of people in the industry who aren't very, you know, they're just here for, you know, we talk about money grab and that kind of stuff. Right. And, and that applies to uh, both inside and out, outside the industry and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, with, with regulations and, and Delta aid and all kinds of things going and people wanting to, uh, you know, obviously increase their sales and market share and maybe not stopping to think, okay, cool. What's going to be the long-term repercussions of this? You know, mm -hmm. how long is this going to be, how long is this going to last? Or is it just something I'm be able to do for a few months and do it, you know, um, as opposed to something that's sustainable. You know, I think we, we look at that. Of course, everybody wants sales tomorrow, right? Everybody wants sales today, but where are we going to be a year from now, two years from now? you know, and what, what am I putting in, into my business now? So um, definitely, definitely amazing. And uh, what about, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, visibility, do you feel like it's like cool, Miriam Temp, everybody knows about us now. Like we have so much business or another, is there still stuff that you guys are still like growing or, or trying to explore and, and get better with, with that? Oh no, we, we don't feel that way. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, yes, we do have a pretty large customer base and we've been able to, to, I mean, we, you know, we were able to survive the pandemic and, you know, all that, but, um, we still feel there's a lot more to do. Um, I feel that like, we still have a lot more work to do. There's still a lot of competition out there. There's still a lot of people out there that are, that have bigger companies, bigger budgets, you know, there's always going to be someone better. Um, so we're, you know, for us, I think for me, and, you know, Jeff, we just like to focus on us. We don't really focus on who's doing what or, you know, you know, there, there are certain competitors that that compete, I guess, competitors in the sense that they they're they're also um, they also deal with the same type of people that we do. There's a there's a few brands out there that also deal with a lot of medical patients that we're that we're familiar with. Um, but I've, I've always just been more of the type that, you know, if I focus more on my company and growing my company, I don't need to focus on what they're doing. Um, and that's kind of always been, yeah, that's kind of always been my motto. Like I, I've, I've always focused more. I'm like, that's great. They have a lot of customers. They probably do more sales than us, you know, cause for a while it was really hard to, it was, 
it was a little frustrating for us to see other companies like us open up manufacturing facilities, open up grows. And we're just like, oh my God, we got it. We got to get something going. And we, like I said, we did try in California and that's why we decided to move out because we knew that in order for us to keep growing, we weren't going to do that in California. It was going to be impossible. Um, so I think from here on out, it's just, we just have to keep focusing on growing and, um, and expanding. And I think that, like I said before, I think with education, um, that's really key. Um, not trying to sell products necessarily, but trying to sell information or give information to customers, to potential customers and educate them and teach them about the industry. Um, and so I think that's, that's definitely key. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, uh, you know, thanks for sharing that for sure. You know, it's, you, you know, it's, um, it, I agree with you hundred percent, right? Competition. There's always going to be this aspect of competition, right? But there's mm -hmm. always, you know, either I can focus on someone else and what they're doing, or I can focus on what we're doing and doubling down on its work. Exactly. And, and realize yeah. that I'm, we're doing our part and we're doing our thing. And uh, what's meant to come is, come to me is going to come to me anyways, as long as I keep putting, you know, uh, the actions in my corner, maybe not always the results, you know, but I can keep pushing forward and keep doing what's working for me and, and keep, keep going that way for sure. So, yeah, definitely. So cool. And then, you know, as we wind down, you know, I'd love to hear what, you know, more about Miriam's hemp in terms of, uh, what you guys have coming down in the future, anything exciting coming up. So right now we're just waiting to get the, the, the manufacturing facility open. Um, we are also doing a, so we're also in within that manufacturing facility. We're not only going to be manufacturing our products, um, but we also have a white label company that we're, that we've also started. Um, so we already white label for a few people here and there. Um, we have already have a few white level, white label customers. Um, so that's going to be really exciting. I'm really excited to get that going as well. Um, so there's that part of it. Um, but there's just, there's so much to do, you know, you have to get, and you have to go through inspections and get permits and all that stuff. So right now we're just waiting on, um, permits to get, to officially be able to go in there and start working. Um, but yeah, I mean, hopefully, uh, you know, once we get going, um, there's a few other products that I've already, we've already been, we've, we have some things that we've discussed that we potentially want to roll out in the future. Um, a gummy line. Um, adding more topicals, um, coming out with more um, other cannabinoid extracts, um, CBC, um, there's THC something, T, T, no, no, um, not THC, sorry, um, CTE, I guess, another cannabinoid that I've been hearing about. Um, so, you know, as time goes on and more and more more comes out, you know, we just, we want to just roll out products, um, you know, in the near future, but yeah, we definitely have more stuff in store. Uh, but right now we're just focusing on just being able to open, um, and, and get our manufacturing facility open. Um, cause like I said, we literally just moved here. So we just got it finished. Um, you know, we just redid the whole warehouse, gutted it, flooring walls, everything. Um, because doing, you have to following GA, GMP standards, there's specific ways that you have to do everything. Um, so it's just, it's a lot of work. It's definitely a lot of work. No, for sure. You got your plate full already. They're moving to a new, uh, you know, state, everything like that, opening up the manufacturing facility. Um, and very exciting as well, you know, with the uh, white label, that, that was great. So, um, you know, people were able to uh, find well, you know, things that are manufactured the right way. Someone who's been doing it for a long time here knows a lot about the industry and doing it for the right reasons. So I appreciate that for sure. So thank you. I appreciate that. You know, uh, now before I let you go, I always, I always ask this question really interested to hear what you have to say, you know, in terms of what you've seen throughout the years and in your story and everything, you know, how do you define success, right? Whether professionally, personally, spiritually, otherwise, right? What does success look like for you? I feel like success is when you're able to help other people. Um, and at the same time, obviously still maintain the, the integrity and, and keep the quality of your products and, um, and keep, and keep the company going at the same time. Um, I mean, to me, whenever 
I get a testimonial from somebody and they send me a video of their kid and, you know, it's a video of an autistic kid that's, you know, a before and after video, for example, of a kid that's, you know, having a lot of behavioral issues. And then they show a video and after of the kid laughing and playing and being happy and talking, um, that to me is success. Cause it's like, okay, that's right there. That's the reason why we went through everything that we went through. That's the reason why we went to murder mountain. Um, you know, there, that's the reason why, you know, we spent sleepless nights thinking we were going to get raided. Um, that's why, you know, when we get, when we see those, those testimonials and those, those, how we're helping people, that's how, that's when I feel successful. Um, you know, it's not really necessarily about the money. It's not about that. I mean, yes, everybody wants to make money. Who doesn't, but it's, it's mainly about how you're making other people feel and what you're doing for other people that I feel is important because then everything else comes after that you know, um, all the other, all the other things come after that, but it's really mainly about how, what you're doing for others that I, I feel like you defined a success, um, to me. For sure. For sure. You know, definitely. I'm sure you've seen, uh, so many amazing stories. And like you said, the videos mm -hmm. and, and ways, testimonials, ways that you've helped other families. Um, and like you said, right. Maintaining your integrity, maintaining the integrity of your products and keep things going, you know, of course. So, um, I love that. And definitely, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the emotion and the, the reason, and that just lends once again to, to your mother, right. And what she, what she's continued, mm -hmm. right. You know, uh, uh, not to get too philosophical or, or esoteric or everything, but, you know, in, in, uh, in, in our faith tradition, right. You know, we have, um, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So every single year, right? It says that everybody's judged, right? And it says those who are here with us and those who are not here with us, right? And it says, okay, cool. So I can understand why those who are here with us, right? Okay, cool. I did good things. I did bad things this year. Like there's certain things that I need to, you know, make amends on and things I can do better. And there's certain things that are, wow, like that was awesome. And I definitely improved from last year and all that kind of stuff, right? But what do you mean people who aren't here anymore? Like their, their life is done, right? So, so what's the point, right? So it says, no, the opposite, right? Because they they've influenced people and they've made a change on people and those people are still doing things in their merit, right? Those people are still, you know, uh, doing amazing things and positive things. And they're able to, to affect um, that, that aspect as well. You know, people who, who mm -hmm. aren't here as well and to have that, they're continuing to have a ripple effect, you know, in the world right. so to speak, you know, based on their actions in this world. So there's no yeah. doubt that, you know, that, that your mother Miriam is uh, definitely having an amazing, amazing impact on, she had on you, but you're also having an amazing impact on her now, you know, yeah. right here with you. you yeah. know, less. Right. And I think that, that you mentioned my mom too. Um, I, that definitely also is another thing that where I feel okay, we're accomplishing something. This is, is when people say, you know, your mom should be so proud, your mom, this, your mom, that I love that people still mention my mom. Um, and you know, I've, I've always made it a point to like, make sure that like people know who she is, you know, and, um, because my mom was also a very, um, giving person, a uh, very caring person. Um, and so that is also another, I guess, way that I measure, our success with the company is when people still say, you know, your mom, this and your mom, that, because it's, well, that's, she's the reason why we started this. No, definitely. Definitely. And it's uh, not, you know, it's, uh, it's not just like, you know, lip service, so to speak, it's, it's, it's real. So I'm, I'm, I'm right. glad that you feel that as well. So, um, cause that's the important thing, obviously. So as we close, you know, how can our listeners find out more about Miriam's how I'm, uh, find you, connect with you, buy your products, everything else. And even, you know, with the white labeling or wholesaling, everything like that. Yeah, actually. And we do, uh, yeah, we, we, our website is miriamshemp.com. Um, we're also on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and, uh, people can just contact us directly that on our 809, our 800 number line, um, or they can email me as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we do the white label. We don't have the website up yet. We're working on that right now. Um, but we will be making obviously announcements via our social media once that's up and running. Um, and then also to, if people, we do also offer um, wholesale and distributors. So if anybody has a store, 
storefront or they're a distributor, um, we do also offer those options as well. Um, and then of course the white labeling. Um, but like I said, we don't have that website up and running just yet. Uh, but yeah, they can contact us directly through our website. Amazing. Amazing. Everybody check out. You've heard what they're doing. You heard everything and, um, um, amazing story. have been doing it for a long time and uh, quality stuff. So Dan, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate, you know, also going down that, uh, uh, that path with me and, and for sharing your story, the emotion, everything behind that. Um, so thank you again for jumping on with us, everybody at home or wherever you listen to us in your car, wherever's going on in the office. Uh, thanks for, for checking us out today too. And uh, good luck to you the rest of the year and beyond. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Dank Discussions. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. Please make sure you subscribe and leave a review. We want to continue making dank content you want to hear, so give us some feedback about the topics you want covered. Feel free to reach out to us at grow at calican.com. That's G-R-O-W at C-A-L-A-C-A-N-N dot com. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter for our latest updates.